an odd thing to honor those who died in defense of our country, in defense of us, in wars far away. The imagination plays a trick. We see these soldiers in our mind as old and wise. We see them as something like the founding fathers, grave and gray-haired. But most of them were boys when they died, and they gave up two lives, the one they were living and the one they would have lived. When they died, they gave up their chance to be husbands and fathers and grandfathers. They gave up their chance to be revered old men. They gave up everything for our country, for us. We owe them a debt we can never repay. All we can do is remember them, what they did, and why they had to be brave for us. Good evening. Today is Monday, May 30th, 2022, and it's the 99th episode of New Paradigms. I'm your host, Sargis Singiri. Before we begin our podcast today, I do want to take this opportunity to wish all our audience members out there a blessed Memorial Day. Uh, today, I had the pleasure and the honor of being the keynote speaker uh, at addressing the Assyrian American veterans and their families at the Assyrian American Veterans Monument here at Elmhurst Cemetery which was erected by AMAT post number five. AMAT's also, which is formerly known and called as uh, Veterans of World War II, Korea and Vietnam, also known as American Veterans, is the largest and the oldest veterans service organization that is open to fighting for all veterans and their families. Established on December 10, 1944, and currently comprising of 250,000 Members and growing Assyrian Americans were the first to establish an AMAT post here in Illinois, and the second group of Americans to set up an uh, AMAT post in the continental United States, with AMAT post number five being established here in Chicago. It is my honor today to have three guests with me that are here today to speak about the, another issue which our veterans community is facing today on this Memorial Day. Gary Ott, uh, director and cinematographer, Karen Pearson, executive producer, and also Mitch uh, Kors, I see, who is the producer of the documentary uh, Saving 22 and the creative minds behind the documentary that really chronicles the uh, shattered remains uh, left behind when a veteran takes his or her own life, uh, the uh, courage and the bravery of those men who have come from the precipice and also the organizations that have uh, stepped in and stepped forward to make a difference. Before we begin, I want to introduce them with this introduction video of their work. see people with their necks, part of their necks gone, arms gone. You lay awake at night and you think about what had happened. There was a, a real intense fire with all the, the diesel and one of the Marines yelled out, somebody shoot us. The night UD goes off, you live, he dies. There's 18 year olds, 20 year olds seeing their buddies die. And then think, okay, you. You're going home, no more danger. They came home with something that happened over there. And even though they're home, that thing is still going on in their lives. I'm in a lot of pain. I'm struggling to walk and I'm struggling to live. And so the answer was, take this pain pill. The VA knows there's a problem, but they don't know how to fix it. A few days before Christmas, my best friend that I grew up with actually ends up killing himself. The funeral home called me. Do you mind coming in and putting him in his uniform? I survived, they did not. I have to represent them in my best possible way. Maybe all I am is sending out a message, and maybe that message is enough and is powerful enough for somebody else to be inspired to do something else for whatever they can do. How can we have a positive light on the world? How can we set out positive ripples across the world? 22 Veterans Day committed suicide, and 
almost the 22 push-ups a day, right? We're in Red on Fridays. It's doing those things that we can do to help support each other. Also knowing that I got your six. It's teamwork. Train as a team, succeed as a team, fail as a team. Nobody should be out there all alone thinking that they're a one-man army all by themselves. And we're saving lives every day because of the effort of our veterans and our communities coming together and helping veterans who are struggling with this suicide. Uh, Gary, uh, Karen, and the Mitch, uh, is a blessing to have you guys here. Uh, much appreciate for joining me here today. Uh, Gary, you got the floor, buddy. Uh, uh, thank you very much for uh, coming out here today to present this uh, documentary, at least, and segments to us. It's an honor. You know, thank you for the time. Thank you for the platform. Thank you for, I mean, what a uh, beautiful day to be talking about this, I guess. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you know it, it's, uh, it's an honor to be a part on this day. So thank you very much. The, um, um, yeah, go ahead, sorry. Oh, Gary, I was gonna say that, uh, you know, I know that you have it as Saving 22. Um, uh, I know that, you know, those numbers fluctuate. What led you and your creative team to initially go down this path as far as the movie is concerned? Well, when, when this all started, um, <laughs> jokingly, I like to say it's uh, Mitch and Karen's fault, and uh, but it's it's been such an honor to to be, I guess you can, I mean, you know, the director, but it's been more, you know, we're working together. I mean, this has been this has been something that's on our hearts, you know, something that means a lot to a lot of different people. Um, what you know, and I think that uh, just suicide in itself, is, you know, just wrecks people's lives. Um, whether it's a veteran or, I mean, my, uh, my art teacher, you know, you know, committed suicide and it just, it, you know, it was, it's, so I can only imagine, I don't, I, I can't even imagine what it's like for, you know, some of these soldiers that I've, you know, and, uh, and veterans that I've talked to and it's like multiples four, eight, you know, whatever, you know, and, you know, it's, I can't even imagine, especially someone that's under your command. You know that you you lost someone because even though we move back, you know move to our places you know across the country, you know we're still we're still connected, and that that ownership uh, that that uh, just watching out for you know and so when somebody is gone, um, it just uh, it, it's it, you lose an opportunity to take care of your buddy, and that's what that's what I love about the military is that you just I don't know, man. You just don't get the camaraderie anywhere else. I mean, you can just say some outlandish stuff and nobody judges you. And, and it's like, you know, it's almost kind of like, you know, a one upmanship, you know, within the military is that, you know, who can say the most outlandish thing, but we all laugh and it's like, it's, it's whatever. And it's just, you know, I don't care what your background is, where you come from, what, you know, your skin color looks like. It doesn't matter. You know, it's like, we're all brothers. We're all sisters. And so, when, when this all come together, um, yeah, Mitch and Karen, you know, pre you know, presented me the idea that, that this is something that needed to be done. And I'm, I'm honored. I mean, this, this project, you know, clearly chose me and I'm very honored. I'm, I'm pretty humbled about it. It's pretty humbling. No, Karen, uh, I was going to ask you on, um, I know that you're a co-founder of uh, a non-for-profit. Did, did uh, your experience with the non-for-profit have anything to do with uh wanting to go uh, pursue this movie? It had everything to do with it. Gary made our first promotional video for the Adapted Performance Center. And when he was finishing that video, I said to him, you know, we have to do a documentary about this, right? And at that point, he's like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. So fast forward two years later, and here we are going, okay, it's time to make a documentary. And looking at the suicide rate for, in the last 20 years, things have gone so horribly wrong since 9-11. And all of our soldiers coming back are dealing with things that, that civilians don't even understand. And so if we can even in the smallest way help them to understand what our veterans are going through, the experiences that they had, and what day-to-day -day life is like for them, 
and inspire them and urge them to do something to help make a difference in the lives of our veterans, then I think we've achieved what we wanted to do with this documentary. And so it really has been something that, that we've all worked on with situations we've experienced, Mitch and I, through the Adaptive Performance Center that have kind of brought it all together. Mitch, your perspective, uh, if you don't mind, I know that uh, uh, it's a lot of work, of course. Uh, you wouldn't just take something like this without understanding how it affects everything else you have to do on a daily basis. Uh, what was it that triggered that said, this is the right uh, document to make right now? I think, <clears throat> excuse me, I think uh, when Karen and I first started out, uh, we were we were working with the a National Guard group and six of the Guard members while we were working with them had committed suicide. So that really brought it forth that we needed to do something and show these people, show the American citizen what is going on with our military and what goes on in their minds after they've been deployed, after they've even got out of reserves or anything like that. And we thought this was going to be the thing. And we got Gary Ott, uh, the poor guy has worked hourless on this for us. And it's, I think it's going to be amazing. Gary, I do know that we have a number of uh, videos that we have out here um, in segments. I did want to uh, maybe look at the first uh, segmented video that we have, and I'll let you guys choose who wants to initially introduce and talk about it. But let's take a look at the first one out there that we have in the queue. The doorbell rang. And it was the coroner and two officers. Don had taken his life three days before he was supposed to pin on Colonel. I remember in fourth grade having the word catatonic on my spelling list. That night when I had to tell our boys about their dad, that's when I understood the definition of catatonic. They were in shock. They were 14 and 12. Those first few days, it wasn't even the first few days, first few months, first few years. Now, 12 years later, there are days I don't want to get out of bed. Both of our kids attempted suicide. Their role model had it became an option for them. It was on Ben's 20th birthday. He was off at college. I woke up that morning and looked at my cell phone and I had a message from Ben. Off. 
I called his phone right away. He didn't answer. He had attempted that night. His roommates got him the help that he needed. But I will always, always be on some sort of suicide alert. You know, guys, uh, it's difficult. Um, I've served so many years in the military. I've dealt with officers, senior officers taking their own lives. It's never easy. You know, I told you that the privilege of being a keynote speaker today at uh, the Australian AMVATS, Pulse Number 5. And, uh, you know, uh, my kids say, uh, Dad, uh, we've never seen you cry, not even at, uh, you know, uh, Grandpa's funeral. But uh, today at the end of my speech, uh, it kind of got to me, uh, looking at the names of the service personnel that, uh, you know, gave the ultimate sacrifice. And just that little bit of a uh, chink in the armor sometimes, we would say in the military, but that crack of showing your human side uh, opened a couple of doors. I had a, a veteran who uh, came up uh, while the ceremony was going on and said, thank you very much. We did lose a lot of brothers, and you could tell in his voice that me um, having that crack in my voice did open up a door. And on the way, uh, when I was uh, heading to the vehicle with the family, I saw a veteran who was uh, sitting in his car and was crying, uh, weeping from both eyes. And, uh, you know, you get to sense that maybe what you said, just because you showed your human emotion side of the house, it actually opened the door for him to talk about what he's dealing with. I was able to pass on my phone to him, phone number, and invite him to come to be part of my VFW, VFW 3579, which is a lot of Vietnam vets are involved in it. And uh, you never know, it's that human touch, that relationship as a young man is saying, I miss dad. Uh, and unfortunately, one of the teachers that he had in his life was gone. Um, I, I don't know how to describe it. I'll leave it up to you all. Well, I greatly appreciate your insight on, to, on your today. You know, um, as a host, I understand it's very difficult to input your feelings, your whatevers, you know, into a show. But, you know, in this instance, I'm, I'm, I'm thankful. Um, as I was shooting this and, you know, going about, you know, telling the story, one of the th one of the uh, aspects I was it, it was hard for me to find was the big brass or, you know, the high ranking NCOs like the command sergeant major, sergeant major, you know, you know, obviously, you know, she was married to a lieutenant colonel and he was about to be a colonel um, in the Air Force. But, you know, I never got the perspective of what it was like being that leader, that commander who's, you know, you know, in, in a tent and an office or, you know, whatever, handing out the orders away from the battlefield, knowing people are not coming back. And, you know, I mean, I would, I don't want to speak on anyone's behalf, but we do talk about survivor's guilt and, and, you know, and it, it's, I think what I really appreciate what you just shared there is that as a soldier, we are trained not to be human. You know, it's like, we are trained to kill people. We are trained to just swallow it, eat it, you know, just whatever, you know, put it behind us and don't cry. Because if you get cry, if you start crying, it start, if you start feeling, then then you're going to lose your edge, and you got to keep moving forward and get the mission done. And the hard part is listening to you, right? And and this is what I appreciate about that is that we are trained to suppress, you know, the horribles, right? And then when you transition out of the military and become a you know a part of the civilian sector. It's almost like a dam breaking, you know, is is kind of what it feels like was it's kind of what it's like, because you are now forcing I mean, not forced. You are forced, you know, to deal with those suppressed, you know, those suppressed feelings and emotions and, and everything that you stuffed before. And it's very well, I mean, it can be very catatonic to use her word to use um, Kristen's word. And it's a very, it's a very suitable word it can be very catatonic because now all of a sudden the whole world that you knew 
is crashed. It's gone. It's it's uh, shattered. You know because you're you're showing up every morning zero six. You're in formation to go PT. Then zero nine. You know after breakfast after chow, and then you're doing your job. So and then you're always with somebody that looks like you that's dressed like you. Now you get in the civilian sector and it's like okay so now. It's it's like the, the the commercials. Now it's an army of one. And how do you get that brotherhood back, you know, sisterhood back? And when you are, I guess when you're when you're trying to be a human, I guess you know, learning how to be a human. I mean, now you, it's almost like I don't know, man. It's it's not trying to be campy, not trying to be weird, but it's like it's almost like going through puberty again because like now all of a sudden you have all these emotions, you don't know what to do with them. And they have, and you have nowhere to go with them. And you, and as a, as a as former soldier, you're supposed to be tough and take on all things. And it's a so what? But when you have all these things crashing on you, you know how how is a person supposed to be, you know, rock uh, rock strong, rock solid? You know, it, it it's uh, we're we're gonna be fragile. You know, where the littlest thing affects us, because like you know, when, when you're trained, that's like okay, somebody come around the corner just you know happenstance you know it's like and scares it you know scares you you know i mean how you know and then all of a sudden it's like you feel stupid for because like it's not going to happen i mean so i don't know i you know so i don't know it's a whole lot of words but i really appreciate you know being in your position being a retired lieutenant colonel um in the army and it's like and and the and you having to you know put up with you know your feelings and emotions i i, I we all have them we all have them and it's uh, I, I appreciate you opening it up, you know, to to let officers and, and command, you know, in toward uh, command sergeant majors and, you know, sergeant majors, you know, start expressing as well. Well, you know, we do always say that uh, mission first people always and uh, uh, in that aspect, you're right. Uh, in the military, you have a uh, brotherhood. Um, and, you know, I know we use the word brotherhood, but uh, as I told my uh, uh, my my family members, uh, my kids, uh, you know, I've even told them, you know, uh, your brothers uh, are born into your family. Your sisters are born in your family. But the fellowship that you have in the military, you choose those individuals to be your friends. And that's completely different. That means they go through a process by which you say, I'm going to devote my time, efforts, uh, emotions, and supporting these individuals. And uh, you know, and the only way I approach it uh, um, is I always say it, what has helped me deal with uh, decisions I made, that no decision is a right or wrong decision. It's just a decision, and it has consequences. Um, I had uh, requested uh, um, uh, two individuals to uh, come from headquarters to support us in the field on my first mission. I had taken my team to al -Ambar province, and um, uh, last minute, uh, I saw that they were getting on a convoy. I pulled them off the convoy. I said, no, you're not taking the convoy. You're going to take the helo because, uh, you know, I did the risk assessment. Convoy is much more dangerous. And uh, five minutes after I was done talking to uh, one of the soldiers, uh, uh, the helo went down and uh, had eaten dam. And we had to spend the entire time fishing the bodies out. Uh, because uh, one of the Marines that was on that helo had dropped his body armor and had caught the foot of the soldier that had just pulled off uh, with, uh, you know, young kids and his family. Now, that's a decision I made. I, I don't regret the decision at the time that I made, but the decision was that it's safer to put you on a helo. I never thought that it would be putting him in a position where he would lose his life. Um, you know, these are the things you kind of deal with. Uh, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, like I said, in the military, you have uh, brotherhood individuals. You've chose to be part of that uh, tight family and you could sit and talk to them about these issues. Once you leave, uh, you know, that's your own decision. And you kind of have to go through the process as you see Memorial Day after Memorial Day, Veterans Day. And, uh, you know, and even for me, it's difficult every time I go to Iraq uh, or I've been there, you know, you go by areas where, you had uh, service members that you knew who had been killed. And uh, those areas are now given to, you know, individuals who are against U.S. Uh, government policies in the region. But, 
it, it is one of those factors we get to deal with. I know um, that uh, we have a couple of other segments that we want to look at, and uh, I'm going to go into the second segment and then bring Karen and Mitch in to kind of talk about it. Uh, and I'm hoping that what I stated does kind of piggyback into the second segment we're going to queue up now. There's probably very little that any of us could comprehend, understand about what it's like to watch someone die. That's bad enough. Let alone watch somebody that you have ate with, slept next to, fought with next to, stood side by side, went through training together, literally became brothers. And an IED goes off, you live, he dies. Survivor guilt has created probably a huge part of the suicide rate because there's 18 year olds, 20 year olds seeing their buddies die and then they have to come home and figure out why they lived and why their buddy didn't. Karen, uh, I do have experience on that, but I wanna take your perspective on, on that particular uh, piece and really speaks significance, uh, I mean, volume to guys like me who've been down the range. You know, one of the things, like I said in that, in that clip, the, these young people who are seeing their buddies die and they're still, they're still puppies themselves, it's so difficult for them to, to recover from that. And we see it all the time. We see it on a daily basis, the survivor's guilt, the issues that a lot of our members have who are still here. And when you look at the title of this documentary, Saving 22, and you start talking about, well, you know, 22 veterans a day are, are committing suicide. I look back over the last year and I see some of the things that have happened. And one of, one of the biggest things is when all of the stuff went down in Afghanistan last September, it was, it was an all hands on deck at that point to make sure that our members and the veterans in our community had somebody to reach out to them to make sure they were okay. Because now they have, they have brothers and sisters that died over there. Now they feel like it's for nothing. They felt bad enough that it was that they had enough guilt that they came back. But now they are thinking that their brothers and sisters died in vain. And there was a lot of pain and a lot of trauma and a lot of living things at that time. And so when, when you look at that survivor's guilt, we try very hard to help them understand that, that they are still here because there are still, there's still impact for them to make. And I believe that through, again, through this documentary, this is where impact is going to come from. And everybody that we interviewed, all of the people Gary managed to go out and interview as well, all of these people were so willing to share their experiences with us and really get to the heart of some of the issues. And it was very courageous for them to do that. And so, again, the things that, the things that any service member is going to experience when it comes to survivor's guilt is something that I hope that we can help, again, the American people understand the severity of that. No, look, um, I, um, I was on, when I was in Alambar, we, it was very dangerous. Uh, a mission came up for us to be able to execute in the Diala province, which at that time was dangerous too. Uh, this was just prior to the first surge and uh, uh, I had uh, said that my team was set to go to Diala to conduct those type of missions because of my language background. Um, however, uh, a colleague of mine, a friend who had uh, actually gone to the same uh, course as I had, um, and we had, you know, graduated together, um, uh, said, I'll take the mission, and his team took it. Um, they hit an IED, he ended up being killed during that IED, and I know that when they were moving the body uh, back to uh, headquarters, uh, uh, his, uh, his uh, cell phone had rang, 
and uh, you know his wife was trying to see if he's okay. Um, years later, I had an opportunity though when uh, we were looking at individual heroes to put them in the uh, Hall of Heroes. Possibly, I was at the uh, Special Warfare Center of school, and his name came up in his packet uh, in my hand. And uh, you know, you have to go through a certain progression to see if the soldier qualifies. And I know that. There was an argument whether or not the soldier should be put in because he hadn't served that much time with the branch. And uh, my only debate was uh, the individual died on the battlefield for this branch. It doesn't matter how long he served. Uh, but uh, uh, it was difficult. Uh, and we tried to do whatever we can for the spouse. But those, those moments you remember. Uh, and they always stick to you. And... Uh, uh, is is the reality of combat operations? You know, I uh, um, uh, given the fact that I'm the host of the show, I'm um, I'm trying to make sure that uh, I don't get into the emotional aspect of it, but uh, just a glimpse into some of the issues that we have to deal with uh, on a daily basis uh, as we move forward in our life. I do want to bring the third segment in the video that we have, and uh, Mitch, I want to take your perspective on it. Let's go ahead and queue up the third segment of the film. I want everyone to have that feeling. <clears throat> they achieved a goal and they got the butterflies and they got excited. That's, that's what coaching's about. That's what I want for our vets. I want them to achieve goals. They still have goals. They're human. They've got to have goals. Every day we live, we have goals. And every day you achieve them, you get the butterflies. It's exciting. Mace, you got the floor, buddy. All right. Um, you know, we talk, I talk a little bit about goals. Kind of my background is in coaching. There's a lot of goals. But when I'm here at the Adaptive Performance Center and I'm working with my vets, they talk to me about their goals and what they want to do and how good a shape they want to get back into where they were when they were when they were in when they were serving and when they achieve that goal it is a great thing because it puts a big old smile on their face and you know it's helping them get out of the dirty ugly place that they were at they were in so that's why i love working with these vets because they have great goals and it's a lot of it's a lot of enjoyment for me and I, I believe it brings a lot of enjoyment to them and uh, it really helps them uh, in the long run. No, it does. Look, for us, uh, the VFW was absolutely enormous. I mean, I'm, I'm around Vietnam vets, uh, but, uh, you know, they brought me into their brotherhood and uh, uh, our Tuesday meetings and coffees that we have in the morning, every chance I get, have uh, been absolutely enormous. Uh, and just seeing what they had to go through, uh, different than, you know, the modern veterans. Uh, but some of the issues that you guys addressed, uh, you know, whether it be the uh, burn pits, uh, which the house might be looking at passing pretty soon, uh, and to include uh, Vietnam vets, uh, one of them being my cousin who wasn't at the ceremony today because he's suffering from the uh, uh, effects of Agent Orange. A lot of the vets that I know, are affected by it to include their grandchildren, uh, that uh, some of those uh, chemicals that were used actually transfer through the placenta to the next generation. Um, so it's, uh, it, it's difficult sometimes, my wife says, you know, you might be doing busy work, you know, concentrate on um, uh, some other jobs that might be much more uh, productive when it comes to, you know, just uh, getting what is needed to run a family, but uh, I, I think it's hard for veterans uh, not to be in service uh, to the nation even after they leave. Uh, it becomes very difficult, and if you don't give them a goal, as you said, to be able to achieve, to do something that is alongside what their talents were in the service, it becomes very hard for them to be able to function um, in, uh, in the civil society. Um, but um, on your um, non-for-profit, uh, if you and Karen can uh, a little bit emphasize as to what, what is the main mission on the non-for-profit and uh, how many veterans do you guys really push through that non-for-profit uh, on a yearly basis? 
our mission at the Adaptive Performance Center is to make what seems impossible possible, and that is eliminating the veteran suicide rate. We do that through the use of physical fitness and recreating community. And we have been open right about two years, just over two years. We've had over 500 men and women come through that door. We have probably 40 to 60 a day that come into the facility. And as you walk in, we have three big lounges. And they have the opportunity to just sit and, of course, there's a coffee pot. They have the opportunity to just sit and have a cup of coffee and talk or they can go in the back and work out. It, it's completely up to them what they want to do. But we have had the incredible opportunity to, to have so many people talk to us about what it has meant to them to be able to reconnect with like-minded individuals. And, and I, it makes me think of, of a couple of our Vietnam veterans that we had, and I'll let, I'll let Mitch pick the story he wants to share. But both of these men had a very powerful impact on our veteran community here. And we, we've had enough people come through our doors that we're going to expand our locations to another city. And eventually we'll expand our location to other states because we know that this model makes a difference in the lives of veterans because they tell us on a regular basis that we saved their life. We didn't save their life. This facility saved their life. They did the work by coming through the door and doing what needed to be done to take their life back. And there, there is literally nothing more magical and amazing than watching, watching them reach and achieve a goal. But I'll let Mitch pick which story he wants to tell. Well, there's, there is a couple, two, three, four, five, who knows? Uh, there's something magical happens here every day. We say, uh, one of, one of my best was one of our early members. He was a single amputee and he came in the gym and I always have our, our people warm up on a piece of equipment. And I told him I wanted him to warm up and he said, well, I can't do that. So we kind of went on that day, but the next day he came in and I said, all right, Tom, get your butt in there we're going to do this he was very skeptical but i got him all in there and he started working the piece of equipment and making legs move and he just big old smile and the next day or later that day his daughter called and she was so excited she said you made my dad so happy because he did something he didn't think he could do and he did it and it was amazing. It was just, it made my day for sure. Um, and it, it was just the start of many things that have happened here. Well, Mitch, I got to tell you, you, uh, you know, I'm, I got to tell you guys, I'm uh, very envious of the uh, Vietnam. As I say that their kinship and their working together, is, and they're much more cohesive and much more unified than some of us o OIF, OEF guys. And uh, they kind of put you to shame when it comes to actually getting a lot of stuff done in the service of other veterans. But uh, Karen, I'll give you the uh, uh, your story on on one of those Vietnam vets, possibly. Okay. So you saw him in the clip here just a little bit ago. Um, he was a double amputee, and they sent him here to get stronger because they were fitting him for prosthetics, and he was very weak so he came in to get stronger get the stump stronger get the upper body stronger and the day he got his prosthetics his goal was to walk at the adaptive performance center he didn't want to walk at physical therapy he told his wife let's go to apc and he walked for the first time in three years in this facility. And the beauty of that day was we had a young National Guard, active National Guard young man who was here, probably 22, 23 years old, and we made him take the video of it. There wasn't a dry eye in the place, but it was really wonderful to see this young man look at this seasoned veteran and watch him push as hard as he pushed to walk. And I think it really impacted this young National Guardsman. And that's, that's one of the things that I like the most here is the different ages. 
we have our oldest is 88 and our youngest goes down into the late teens and watching them communicate with each other and watching some of the younger ones go up to some of the Vietnam veterans and introduce themselves and thank them for their service and just sit and talk with them. And the Vietnam veterans love sharing their wisdom with these young people and they hang on every word. And bringing that back together again, I feel like gives the veterans from these older conflicts, it gives them a connection. And when you look at Vietnam, it gives them, it finally gives them honor for their service and the way they should have been treated when they came back. And that's one of the things that I think is so beautiful. Now, as a beautiful, as we always say, welcome home, you know, outstanding job by, by that generation. And I have to tell you, they're the ones that keep me motivated to uh, move <laughs> forward and do whatever I can for our veterans. Um, I do have, uh, I do want to look at the next two clips, uh, one after another, before we start talking. Uh, so I do want to introduce clip number four and clip number five, uh, one uh, back to back, and then I'll bring you in, uh, Gary, uh, for your thoughts on them. I'm in a okay. lot of pain, I'm struggling to walk, and I'm struggling to live. And so the answer was, take this pain pill. At that point, I had a running prescription of Dilaudid. They didn't ask any questions. As soon as I was about out, I'd send them a message on my healthy vet. And then that day, then the new prescription would be over at the pharmacy for me to pick up. At one point, I was on a total of 16 different prescriptions that I took every day. It's rare that I see them start taking these things away. I've never seen it anywhere else to where you can have these people taking just dozens of pills for all these different things. And you look at that and you think, is anybody paying attention to this? When you're feeling that there's no way out, that you can't go on anymore, that it's never going to get better, that you'll never get what you wanted and what you had before, and so much was taken from you. I would just really urge you to, to find your brave again and reach out because the resources are there. Ask and keep asking and keep pushing and don't give up because at the end of the day, therapy is tough. There's going to be some really difficult moments. You're going to want to quit. You're going to want to stop. You're going to want to say this isn't working. It is working and keep pushing through seeking the help and if you're not getting the help here keep looking because it's out there and maybe this isn't working for you but something else will and maybe it's not just one thing maybe it's a combination of things and that's what worked for me it was a combination of things Gary, the reason I wanted to introduce those two clips back to back because I know that the VA still is uh, more tied towards uh, pain medication for the type of therapies that could be done through other means and ways. And I don't know if that helps. It does more to help addiction and, uh, again, leads back down to that suicide path. Uh, but um, I want to give uh, all of you an opportunity to kind of talk about that. Well, why is it that we're still pushing that type of a therapy rather than other therapies that uh, in this case uh, there are out there available for veterans to use i think it's more just the the uh the bureaucracy of it all i mean it's a mob mentality maybe you know it's like you know with uh one person did it before so that's what they're going to maintain um but i mean the va has 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 a there's a lot to be desired you know uh as far as help but with with that being said, there are also there's also a, a push toward the naturopathic, toward um, just different therapies, you know, sitting and talking. And because of, you know, uh, things like care in the community, you know, veterans are able to go outside of the VA um, and and get some help that the VA just can't do. Um, you know, the, there's a. I think I think that you know once people start understanding uh, that they have to be, you know, you can't you can't trust the VA. You can't trust them to just outright you know do what's right for you. And so when a person can start um, finding other avenues, then that's that's how we all get better. 
um, because it's like nobody knows you better than you. Um, and when you, re- you know, rely on a bureaucrat um, or are forced to, you know, work with a bureaucrat, it, it pr- you know, kind of proves that, you know, real quick. And what's beautiful about, you know, uh, what Christy was saying, the, uh, the second uh, of, of the videos you just shown, Christy uh, Barone, she's an amazing person. She's an a, a Army vet. Um, went through some, you know, real stuff in her career. Um, and because of some injuries, she would have failed the MEB. So instead, they just let her PT, uh, ETS out. And now she's working toward uh, becoming a licensed uh, uh, therapist herself. And, and, you know, she's been putting in the work, you know, to become a better human, you know, a better person and figuring out what her next mission is. And she's done that. She's doing that. And, you know, thankfully, she is choosing to be a therapist because what she was saying, I mean, I, I don't what I've heard. And, you know, I mean, there's there's some things that I can, you know, pertain to what, you know, in my life. But it's like what she was saying and, and compared to what I've heard others say is that she, she's very um, supportive um, toward those that are going through some stuff, you know, through therapy, because it's like the first thing that you want to do is like quit. You know, when things get difficult, oh, this ain't working. This, you know, I got to stop. I got to find a different avenue. But she's saying, it's like, you know, what, you know it, it is working. And she can speak from experience. And so when we get <clears throat> people's experiences of going through the naturopathics, and it's not, you know, addressed in those, but it's, uh, you know, like uh, acupuncture or um, cupping or utilizing uh, in, in the one interview, George, you know, was saying that, uh, you know, he, he hurt his back in the Navy and he was suffering. He, he would have to sit in a hot shower for, uh, you know, 30 minutes or so just so his, his muscles would relax and then he could go about you know, his day. Finally, he just uh, went, you know, tried some uh, uh, chiropractic and massage work, you know, to, uh, to work with the muscles and, and the bones. And after about six weeks of, of going through, you know, going to this, uh, the, the, the uh, Yellowstone natural naturopathic clinic, you know, about six weeks uh, program, he's fine. You know, he's, his, his health is great. He's able to move around. He's, he's a functional person. His, his relationships have gotten better, you know, and that, and that's the thing about pain. It's like, you know, I'm not a doctor. I'm not going to you know pretend to one. The only thing I have resembled that the doctor's my autograph. And that's the only thing, you know, but when you have, um, but when you have people going through, you know, the natural processes of, of helping the body work and to heal itself, that's that's uh we should support that you know get away opioids is not um is not a treatment opioids is not a treatment and we need to get away from that and the overuse at the va go ahead the over the overuse at the va of the opioids has is something that's so completely out of control and we address that pretty heavily in the documentary there there's a lot that covers that and the amount of medications and how easy it is for veterans to they can literally get on my healthy vet and have a prescription waiting for them same day next day of an opioid and because of the incredibly ridiculous turnover at the va i think a lot of things fall through the crack and the new providers are not seeing what the old providers were prescribing. And so it just happens over and over again. So we have this opportunity. We have a, the Adaptive Performance Center has a great relationship with the VA. However, the reason we have this great relationship is because they understand that we are a bridge to do things that they cannot do. You can't go see your therapist every day. You can't see your doctor every day. You can't see your physical therapist every day. You can come to APC six days a week. And we get a lot of referrals from them. But on the plus side of that, those referrals that come here, those are men and women who are getting off of medications that they have been on for years and beginning to discover that there are more natural ways to deal with their chronic pain. And so from that perspective and in a very small way, we are starting to make a difference there in the amount of pain medication that people use. And we have the opportunity here 
to have a massage therapist, to have an acupuncturist, to have a physical therapist, they come in and they volunteer their time to help our members. And so our members have this ability to get this exposure to these different treatments without having to ask the VA to pay for it and without having to wait months and months and months for an appointment. And and that that just leads into a whole other a whole other scenario of how long it takes to get into the VA, which could be an entire other segment. But in regards to the the overprescription of the pain medication, I, I think that's one of the most horrible things that's happening. No, it is. Uh, and uh, I know we could talk about it for hours, but, uh, you know, we're running out of time today. But I think that's something I would like to concentrate on, hopefully bring you guys back. Uh, on a follow-up show, and then we could start discussing that. I know we had two other segments. Um, we're going to put those videos up, and then I want to come back and just get your closing thoughts on not just the segments, but overall as far as the movie, and then uh, let us know also once we come back as to uh, when the movie is going to be premiering. So let's go ahead and queue up those last two. For 10 years, I tried to get the VA to send me to Salt Lake the Vascular Center for my leg. It was giving me problems. Swelling up. My right groin was swelling up and I kept asking them to send me down there. Fort Harrison kept turning me down. <laughs> Needless to say, it was a cause of the loss of my leg. The last vascular surgeon said they should have been taken care of a long time ago. And I would have never lost my leg. It was black. It was gone. You know, I could smell it. I could, I could see it rotting off. You know, that's one of the things I'll never forget. And Doc took me in immediately and said, "It's got to go." So we did. It's uh, you know what's happening. You know what's gonna happen until you actually see it. You wake up after that surgery. And see the part of your body is missing. It's a whole new life. Your thinking is totally changed. There's a lot of times that tango gets me through that without having him. Uh, I I don't know how I would have made it through some of those times. I mean, most recently, this COVID shelter in place, stay at home. I can't imagine having completed that without Tango in my life. I probably would have been a, a statistic at this point in time if I didn't have Tango. You know, guys, uh, uh, the first deployment I went to, the last thing that I handed over to our uh, command sergeant major uh, was uh, my own obituary in my file that I had to hand in before we got on the bus and departed. And I remember after our first time in the box, the first time um, our vehicle I was in left to see the right seat, we had an IED, thank God it was at a uh, location that it blew out rather than it blew in. Um, we towed that vehicle on the way back. I was standing outside of our vehicle. We took mortar rounds, took the tactical uh, uh, antenna, uh, tax ad antenna, right over my head out. On the next day, we changed our uh, standard operating procedure, came through a route, and ended up running into a uh, enemy checkpoint, shot up the overwatch position, drove through it. Thank God we saved the life of a, uh, a Iraqi uh, police officer, his intelligence officer, uh, who was about to be beheaded. And on the way back, they tried to blow the bridge we were on, and uh, uh, the vehicle behind us saw that we were completely gone until we came through and saw individuals on the road. And uh, I had to literally push my uh, uh, my NCO, my uh, team sergeant, up as uh, he was numb from the blast, and I had to lean into the uh, uh, at that time at the weapon system uh, in order to engage those targets. Uh, I remember. Um, I came back, sat behind the computer, and uh, shot an email to my brother and my cousin. And I said, hey, look, uh, numbers ain't looking good. If this is how it's going to be, my 
first time out back or first couple of times. And I said, if um, I end up something happening to me, make sure uh, Helen, my wife, gets married because uh, my son, Osher, will need a father figure to raise him. It, uh, what veterans deal with, it's uh, not easy. And uh, as you see, even as you get into the VA, it is very difficult just to get through the procedures. I want to give you all closing thoughts on um, everything that you have worked on. And, uh, you know, how do you feel about where you are today with this documentary? Um, I, I have no idea how to answer that. It, it's just, it's going to be over several beers. <laughs> I mean, it's not just, I mean, I, it's just going to have to be like, you know, a few, you know, it's hours of talking, but you know, I've learned so much. I've, I've learned about me so much because it's one of those things where I, when I was, when I was uh, first enlisted, I, um, I had just missed desert storm and uh, I, I completed my eight years in the reserves and I was never deployed. And it's one of those things where it initially started out as like, you know, others went, you know, were deployed and I never was, even though I would have been a frontline job, you know, but I was, I never saw anything and it just, it, it weighed heavily on me. And then, you know, thankfully, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> thankfully I got to do this because it's, 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 um, it's given me a lot to think about and it's, it's a, a lot to face. And in a sense, you know, I'm, I'm living vicariously through these individuals, you know, with their interviews, because I, if I hear thing, then I have to take it into account in order to keep asking questions, you know, the, the questions to make, you know, to make the story. And Karen, I believe said earlier, um, it's like, I've had so many, so many amazing people step foot, step forward and say, yes. And I can't, thank him and I can't thank him enough but I'll keep trying you know every time I see him it's like I say thank you because this movie is not about me it's not it's not me it's not I mean I'm just the 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 director I guess the start I'm the first sergeant you know so to speak you know but I'm relying on others you know to help me with this story and it's not me you know and and so it's like everything I'm saying it's it's like I have no voice you know my voice you'll never hear in the movie you know and it's by design because it's not my story. And I, it's important to tell everyone's story through their words. So somebody, you know, that's speaking from like Michigan, Oklahoma, um, Oregon, California, Montana. I mean, it's like, you know, somebody in New Mexico or Arizona didn't get to say anything, but maybe what this individual did say from this other state says, and it's like, it gets their point of view across. Well, then that the, the movie did its job and I can't think, I can't think enough, but I'll keep trying. Karen and make sure your closing thoughts. We're very excited about this. We're going to premiere this on June 4th. Our premieres in Billings, Montana at the Babcock theater at 7 PM. And we are very eager to have a packed house and show everyone how this has come together. People have been supportive of us for, for a very long time on this project, and they've known about it for a very long time. And we are eager to share it. I'm particularly eager to share it due to the fact that the hearts of all of the people who we interviewed come through so beautifully. And I feel like it's something more that we can give back to them. And so I just, I don't have enough words to describe what this project has been like and to see it come to fruition is, again, maybe I'll have the words next time we're on, but <laughs> right now they escape me because it's, it really touches my heart and there's been a lot of emotion with it. Maybe you got the last word, buddy. Uh, they say oh give boy, it to the- Oh boy, here we uh, go. Make it tough as yeah. guy, so. Yeah, this is bad. Um, you know, Karen kind of set up the emotion really comes through when you watch this. And I think every time I see this, um, trailers included, I get a tear in my eye. Um, I have to thank Gary and Karen 
for their vision and what they've really brought out uh, in this documentary. And I hope that civilians and vets and active military who see this uh, get hope and see what our what our military goes through to even live each day. Um, it's just going to be a fantastic documentary, be, especially because of Karen and Gary. So, I, and I want to thank you, Zargas, for giving us the chance to be on here tonight. Oh, it was my yeah, honor. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank no, you. Thank you. It was my honor, and uh, I know you guys invited me to be there at the premiere. June 4th is my birthday, but uh, I'm going to be overseas uh, for our audience, so I won't be here. And uh, as I say, hopefully um, I don't become fairy dust and I can make it back, and uh, we'll have a continuation of this discussion. Absolutely. Uh, but, Absolutely. But that's it. It was a blessing having you all here. Uh, God yes, bless you. Thank Keep you. moving forward. We yes, are going to share yes, this sir. message of the video any which way we can. Um, and I want to make sure for our audiences out there, just so you know, uh, that uh, the production that was done today is actually done by Cinema Production. Thank you very much for Fred for uh, dealing with this and uh, wonderful work as always. Um, and Fred's uh, a beast. also, he is. He definitely is. Uh, <laughs> I, I try. I try to uh, make a, a life as difficult on my uh, producer as possible. So uh, I'm, I'm sure none of you guys have to face that with Gary. <laughs> uh, at least I wouldn't. Gary, Gary, if I were you, I would not pick out the, uh, the uh, maybe the uh, executive producer, but I wouldn't mess around with the producer. It looks like nope, you can probably. Nope, absolutely uh, not. Nope. They're the boss. They're the boss. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it was a pleasure having you here for renters out there. No, thank you, listen, sir. Listen, listen thank to everything you, been said, and uh, we'll, we'll uh, uh, we love you guys, and we'll have you back. But that said, there's new paradigms. That'd be awesome. All right, thank sir. You. Thank you so much.